this is John Rubino from dollarclass.com, and you're listening to Run to Gold. Welcome back to the Run to Gold.com podcast. Uh, during this holiday season, I'd like to talk a little bit about charity and economic incentives. Uh, first, I think it's important that we distinguish between the able bodied and the non able bodied when we're talking about uh, charity. You see, disabled animals, they perish very quickly in the wild. It's the old or the wounded antelope that becomes dinner for the lion. They're easier to catch, they can't run as fast. Uh, that's just how the herd is thinned uh, through natural law. Uh, so when we're, we're doing, you know, maybe if there's an able-bodied antelope, I guess if he just sits down and uh, lets the antelope, uh, lets the lion come and eat him, well, that's kind of what he chose to do. Uh, but what about the non-able-bodied? You know, what about the children? Uh, for example, I go down and help at an orphanage in Ensenada, Mexico. These are, you know, for the most part, non-able-bodied. They, they don't have the ability to take care of themselves. And uh, so I go down and paint uh, at an orphanage in Mexico or do other manual labor for them. Then you also have the disabled, uh, people with birth defects or perhaps they're injured. Uh, for example, uh, one of my uncles, about 20 years ago, he was involved in an accident. He was sitting under a bale of hay, and the hay fell on his neck, and now he's a quadriplegic. Uh, so what about him? You know, what about the disabled? Uh, so I also have some friends uh, who work with leper colonies over in India, and that's another example where, you know, they, they're slightly disabled, but culture has really uh, seemed to disable them. Now, famine, it's not a natural condition, but it's an effect of bad policy. Uh, the market, you know, it wants to be able to provide for the needs and wants of people. We want to engage in cooperation. That's raised the standard of living of everybody. Uh, but economics guide the behavior, and the behavior guides the culture. Uh, for example, if the return on investment from violence is profitable, then more violence will be engaged in. Now, many around the world are celebrating Christmas, uh, the birth of the Prince of Peace. But ironically, some of these devout Christians are on errands of death. The more violence that is engaged in, the more morals will be put forward to justify that violence. We saw this a lot during the 500 years of the Industrial Age. Because the return on investment from violence was significantly increased, uh, because the capital assets like mines or factories, etc., were large and they needed large amounts of violence to protect them. And, you know, that violence could either be justified or unjustified. It's, now, obviously, when the return on investment from violence uh, is high, there will be a lot of people who want to justify uh, unjustifiable violence. And so we saw during the industrial age that the return on investment from invading and occupying and expropriating these assets from others it was very high that's why we got uh, mercantilism and neocolonialism and colonialism things like that so we had lots of these institutions arise that awarded little gold stars or little medallions or pens or titles like the great uh, to those who were best at violently getting someone else's resources we had philosophers like Machiavelli or economists like Keynes uh, and priests, whether from Christianity or Islam, etc., who willingly espoused and expounded doctrines uh, in an attempt to soothe the conscience of those engaged in violence, uh, such as perversions of the just war theory or of self-defense. And that show up today. You know, priests and bishops and pastors, they pass judgment uh, the killing while in a uniform is excused or justified and therefore not murder under God's laws. And I would say that, you know, in very few instances, uh, at least in our modern world, uh, is that excuse or justification going to actually be efficacious in a moral sense. Uh, it's especially hard to argue when you're actually over in somebody else's house, uninvited, you know, to claim self-defense. <laughs> uh, there's a reason so many soldiers are buffeted by depression and angst. You know, when people aren't sociopaths, there's natural law to contend with, and it's injustice 
you know, justice, it might grind slowly, but it grinds exceedingly well. And the soothsayings of these priests or bishops or pastors will not pro provide relief uh, when you've had serious infractions, such as murder, against other people's agency or their free will, their ability to choose. But in the information age, we've changed the dynamics of the return on investment from violence. And it's resulting in violence being much less profitable. This is exciting because it pretends a world where individual freedom and peace and cooperation and prosperity uh, will be prescribed by the underlying economic conditions. Already the Austrian School of Economics has taken the upper hand in the intellectual battle as the incoherent babblings of Keynes or Paul Krugman and the other political dogmatists uh, have been rapidly discredited. So getting back to the issue of how to be charitable. So I have a friend who's done substantial work with leopard colonies in India. And I have another friend who just returned from a six-week trip in September, and she went over there as a member of a board of directors for a charity to assess the situation for setting up a substantial program to help leper colonies. So, of course, before she left, I introduced my first friend, who's been over there for over a decade doing this type of work, uh, with my other friend who just went. Mainly because uh, I don't want my, my other friend to have to, to learn by experience what my first friend did. You see, my first friend uh, went through a lot of evolution in thinking that was a result of her experience. Uh, thinking that, you know, I probably could have uh, anticipated and, and perhaps made an argument for just using uh, some, some traditional Austrian economic theory. Anyways, she learned it on her own. You know, people wake up when they will. Uh, she's the wife of a very successful attorney. Her kids were out of the house, and she wanted to do something else with her life that would make an impact. I guess she got bored. So she took some of her considerable resources and began this charity uh, for Indian lepers. She recounts that for the first three or four years, she would organize trips, you know, 30 to 50 medical professionals like nurses and doctors, and they would go over and serve the Indians by clean, they'd clean their feet, etc. Uh, and I mean, this is like gross work. Like one person, you know, they, they clean like 500 maggots out of their feet one evening, and then the next morning they clean another 500 because the flies would like get into their feet and lay the eggs, and then they'd wiggle around in there. I mean, this is pretty, it's just gross. And yeah, they felt good helping people like that. But she later realized that they were being extremely selfish. In effect, they were just trimming the branches, but they weren't attacking the root at all. You know, they'd go over there, they'd clean the maggots out of people's feet, they'd feel good from having done the work, but then they'd go home, and at the end of the day, nothing would change in the leper colony. For example, one lady, she got her feet cleaned every year for three years. And every time she came and got her feet cleaned, they would show her how to clean her feet on her own. But every year, her feet would be in worse condition. You see, the greater the wound the more the beggar would earn. That was the economic incentive. The behavior was not only that she would not clean her own feet, but she would inflict damage to exacerbate the wounds, because then she'd make more money. But this was not limited to just her. Husbands would beat their wives, and the more grievous the wounds, the more the wife would make begging. Even worse, parents would beat and sometimes terminally injure or cripple their children, etc. I mean, the culture has gotten so bad that if the shadow of a leper falls on a regular person who's not afflicted by this, and it's a genetic disease, it's, it's kind of a disease that attacks people who only have a particular type of, of genetics, uh, then, then the, the regular person they would be considered unclean for something like seven days if just the shadow of a leper touched them. But, you know, that shows how economics guides the behavior and the behavior guides the culture. So how do you solve this problem? How do you become a radical? And radical means to strike at the root. 
so my friend, for the last decade or so, has been engaged in striking at the root over there. And she started making microloans to these leper colonies so that they would be able to start micro-businesses. They will borrow uh, small amounts of capital, you know, like three cents, uh, and then the people, they'll start making pots or they'll start delivering tea leaves, uh, etc., and as they repay the loans, they can borrow larger amounts because they're less of a credit risk. And they got to pay interest, too. So remember the lady I told you that, you know, she'd get her feet cleaned every year, but they would always be in worse condition? Well, my friend began charging two rupees to clean feet. Now, this is like half a day's income for a beggar, but two rupees is only like a fraction of a cent. So obviously they're not going over there to make a profit cleaning people's feet. But the lady, she has a new micro business because she was able to get a micro loan. And she pays to have her feet clean because she needs her feet in good condition in order to perform her work in her business so that she can service her loan. And then after the loan's repaid, she'll have retained earnings of her own. So this is, you know, now she, she wants her feet in good condition instead of wounding them in order to earn more begging. Several of the leper colonies, now they have their own retained earnings. And with those retained earnings, they've built their own schools, clinics, hospitals, etc. And they've begun making loans uh, to other people in the colonies. Now, this is interesting. There was one leper who was almost blind because the leprosy had like, gotten up on his face and stuff. And so he couldn't hardly see. And he wanted a loan so he could buy a brush and paint because he had always wanted to be a painter. My friend, uh, she suggested that he not receive the loan. I mean, why would you give loan to an almost blind person to paint? I mean, he's just going to waste the capital. He's going to waste the paint, let alone be able to service the loan. I mean, you, you don't want to do that. Uh, but it wasn't her money to decide with anymore because the loan proceeds, they weren't coming from her or from the charity. They were coming from the retained earnings from several of the micro businesses in the particular leper colony. And so the council decided to grant the loan. This almost blind leper uh, taught himself to paint and he paints these beautiful uh, little postcard sized paintings. And even better, they sell for about $300 on the internet. So he's actually probably the wealthiest uh, in the entire colony. <laughs> because 300 bucks is like, I mean, that's more than these people make in an, in an entire year, even if they aren't lepers in a lot of cases. Uh, but m what's even more exciting than just this person being able to paint, who's always wanted to paint, uh, what's even more exciting is guess who forms the council? My friend organized it uh, with five women who were most responsible in paying back their own loans. But they used to be beaten by their husbands. Guess who does not get loans uh, in this colony? The economics are changing the behavior, and the behavior is changing the culture. So they've actually stopped... Uh, the domestic violence, they've stopped the child abuse and things of that nature because it's no longer profitable. You, you don't get a loan, you can't start your own business, you can't uh, <laughs> because the women they aren't going to give you a loan if you do that type of stuff. Uh, so this is very exciting, you know, the, the, the long-term effects that, that are resulting from this. So what about my uncle? You know, I told you about him, quadriplegic, well, he could have become depressed, you know, being a disabled, a formerly perfectly healthy uh, cowboy becoming, you know, he could have become depressed, he could have moped around, he could have become a really big burden on everybody. Not that he isn't a burden to some degree, I mean, he can't even change his own urine bag, he's completely quadriplegic, uh, but he could have been an even bigger burden, especially an emotional burden. Uh, but instead of, you know, taking that route, he chose, through his own human action, to enroll in college. He graduated in five years, which is faster than a lot of able-bodied people can do. And every paper that he turned in, 
he typed it with a stick that he held with his teeth, and he poked out letter by letter every sentence. But it didn't just stop there. He's flown around the world lecturing and advocating for the disabled, often with other notables like Christopher Reeves, the former Superman. Through extremely hard work and discipline and perseverance, my uncle, he's made something great out of his life where he could have taken a different path. And in the process, he's provided the opportunity for others to serve him, like his wife or my, my other uncles or aunts or even myself. You know, I, at our last family reunion, uh, I helped get him in the shower and get him into bed and everything like that. And he's also provided the opportunity for nurses and doctors to profitably serve him. And uh, this, is, this is a way that he's been able to make something with his life, and he's been able to add value to society. You know, so the wounded antelope doesn't just necessarily add value to the lion in our human society. They can, the, the blind leper, the quadriplegic, they can actually find other ways to add value uh, to, to the rest of humanity. So in this holiday season... You know, I hope we will be charitable. I hope that, you know, we'll go out of our way just a little bit more to be kind and nice in this season. I was going to write a blog post about a really scary scenario that just happened uh, in Australia, but I guess I'll, I'll save it for after Christmas. <laughs> um, but in our charity, I hope that we won't be selfish. And even worse, I hope we won't be counterproductive. Many, especially, you know, government, they would take the people out of the slums. But that's just selfish. And in many cases, it only trims the branches at best. Additionally, it can often create many undesirable and counterproductive effects, such as bureaucracy and institutionalization. I mean, look at the fraud that goes on with our welfare system or Medicare, or Medicaid, or HUD housing, etc. Uh, when those resources are required, they're, when they're acquired through force, uh, such as taxation, like with this new health care bill, and then they go through the bureaucracy, they become wasted. And then there are less resources in society overall, and that lowers the standard of living for all. And as that standard of living decreases, uh, the productive members of society, they aren't able to have as many resources uh, to donate towards charitable endeavors, even if they wanted to. And that's one of the big problems that you've got, especially in uh, a lot of these developing countries. You see, the real work is striking at the root. And to do that, you have to take the slums out of the people. And then the people they will take themselves out of the slums. And this is a lot harder work uh, to do, but it's actually a lot more fun. And it goes along uh, with general principles of, of human action. This is done and not by gratifying our own selfish behavior, you know, by giving the bum a dollar, but instead finding ways to engage in peaceful cooperation in society. Uh, through some type of entrepreneurial endeavor, for example. And earning a profit doing that, it's not a bad thing. Actually, it's how you keep score and how you rationally allocate the resources that the market wants in order to provide for the wants and needs uh, that people have. And that's the fundamental problem that you've got with government is they lack that pricing mechanism. They lack that, that profit incentive, so they don't know uh, what needs or wants the market really, really wants. And it's my firm belief that, that everybody uh, has something uh, of value to add to society, even uh, the blind leper does. So you've been listening to the RunToGold.com podcast. This is the charity edition. This is Aaron Crown of MortgageImplode.com, and you're listening to Run to Gold.